Hi, and welcome to On the Spectrum. I'm Laurie Walters, and I'll be your host today. Today, we welcome as our special guest, Sarah Reed, Director of Advocacy and Family Services at ASRC, Autism Services and Resources, Connecticut. If you're on the spectrum or know someone on the spectrum, I think you're going to enjoy hearing from Sarah today about the services they provide, about the benefits, and how to access them. So with that, Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Larry. So to get started, tell us about ASRC. What is it and why was it started? Sure. ASRC is Connecticut's um, largest parent advocacy organization serving the autism community. We service um, across the ages and across the spectrum. So we talk to families who are newly diagnosed with a, a child perhaps under three, and we talk to adults in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. So across the age ranges and across the spectrum. So what is really the focus of the, uh, of the ASRC? What are you really uh, looking to accomplish? Well, we have a, uh, probably three main focus, I would say. The first is information and referral. Uh, families call us, professionals, people in the community wanting information about autism or wanting referrals for various services and supports that might be out there. So that's one focus. The second would be education and outreach, uh, whether it's talking to um, school systems about autism, whether it's talking to employers, after school programs, uh, community groups, anybody and everybody who needs to learn about autism spectrum disorders. And the third piece would be advocacy, um, both at the state and local level for more program services and supports for our families. Excellent. Sounds like a great resource. Let's, start, let's take a step back and start with the first one. Maybe you could explain a little bit more about the initial uh, the initial one you mentioned. Uh, information and referral. Right. Um, to me, that's the heart of our mission. When a family is new to the diagnosis or an individual um, is new to the diagnosis, you can feel very alone, isolated, uh, not know where to turn, what to do. And so hopefully somebody's giving you our number or you find us on the internet and we can help connect you. Because with the numbers of one in 68, you're not alone. There's a lot of people. Right. And the most important thing I think we can do for both families and individuals is to connect them to others so that they don't feel so alone. They meet other people who are living similar lives, face similar challenges, um, and have similar interests. Is that program more for the parents uh, and then the support services uh, for the parents or for the, the people on the spectrum? Well, it's both. It started out, obviously, for the parents. Mm -hmm. um, but as um, we've grown and as more and more individuals on the spectrum themselves have grown and aged, um, we also connect the, the individuals themselves. We have support groups not just for parents, but also for individuals as teens, as young adults, and even middle-aged adults. <laughs> Tell us about how, how some of those programs work. Maybe you can give some examples and some of the ways that are helpful to parents. Well, again, I think the first and foremost way they're helpful is the connection piece, is to feel connected to a community of like-minded people where you can ask questions and get information. And so that, to me, is the most important thing. But in most of our groups, whether we're doing what I call caring and sharing, whether we're sitting around and just talking and sharing ideas or strategies and support, or whether we're bringing in a speaker on a particular topic um, so that you can learn more about something related to living with autism, or whether it's one of our workshops or our educational series or our conference. Um, where we bring in nationally known speakers about autism to provide training and education. Are these programs run regularly or are they just uh, certain uh, times during the month or how, how does that work? Well, it depends again what it is. Support groups generally meet once a month. Mm -hmm. um, some of our more, more social activity types of groups meet a little bit more often. Our conferences once a year, educational programs maybe once a month, or I do various series that are four weekends over a space of two months in various different ways and places because families need to be able, and individuals need to be able to access this, and we all have different lives. Right. So we try to do it at night, we try to do it during the day, on weekends, and in different ways so that everybody hopefully can access this information. Well, that sounds excellent. What are some of the programs that you found to be most successful from the educational standpoint? What are the most popular ones that people really Well, at the moment, I would have to say the most popular one is um, my transition boot camp, hmm. where um, it's a four workshop series, and I do them on Saturday mornings. Um, I travel all around the state doing them. Uh, four sessions on all of the issues related to moving from high school 
or even junior high school, um, to the adult world and what all of the issues that families and individuals need to be thinking about as they're making that transition from services and supports within the educational system to the adult service system. And it's a very different world. Mm -hmm. And you really need to understand the differences so you can be prepared. Is that more for the parent or more for the, the people on the These spectrum? Are, this is more specifically <coughs> for the parents, absolutely, mm -hmm. so that they understand the issues and things they need to be thinking about, questions they need to be asking, resources they should be looking at, and plans, planning. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I would assume it's well attended, too. It's very well attended. <laughs> so they, and they would contact the office and sign up for that in advance? And then... Absolutely. And, and as I said, I do them um, in various places around the state. Last fall, I was in Willington in Norwich. Um, I did them in Plainville in the winter. I'm down in Southport now. So I try to bring them around to various places again so that people don't have to drive maybe more than half an hour or so to right. find one. What are some of the other educational uh, programs that you're, that you're looking at that have been very helpful to parents? Well, I run... Um, a parent speaker series where I bring in local experts. So we have a wealth of people here in Connecticut who are doing amazing work um, with our families and our folks. And so it's, again, information that I think is of importance to both parents and individuals about programs, services, interventions, supports, what's out there, how do I access it, what do I need to know. Hmm. So now, in addition to the resources that are available to parents in the educational series, I know you also offer a lot of services to those on the spectrum. Absolutely. Let's take a look at some of those. Help us understand what some of the areas are and, and what you're seeing. Our, our agency, when we're doing services for our individuals on the spectrum, we focus more on our teens and young adults, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, so in areas of social and recreational activities, a place to go to hang with some friends. Um, to what I would term apply the social skills you're learning in social skills class to the real world. Go out to the movies, bowling, dinner. Um, the girls get together and have sleepovers and paint their nails and do things that teenage girls do. And the guys get together and do things that teenage guys would do um, in a place where there are people like you, where it's supported. Um, so you don't have to worry if there's a social faux pas or whatever. Everybody's, everybody's learning like you and supporting you through it. So I think those are really important, and I know they are extremely well attended. And I bet they're a lot of fun, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely a lot of fun. So that's, that's an important one. Um, this program, for example, um, mm -hmm. I was actually the first guest um, when this was started five years ago, and this is one of the programs um, that we started thinking about, again, ways to get um, our individuals to be thinking about a job, employment, um, what could they be doing as an adult to support themselves. And for most people with an autism spectrum disorder, they need to experience something before, I think that's true actually for all mm -hmm. of us, before they truly understand whether it's something they would like to do or not do, whether they can handle the different environments and, and the um, issues involved in it. So programs like this are wonderful for that. Mm -hmm. We're currently doing an unemployment pilot project actually for mm -hmm. a small group of our young adults who are otherwise quite capable but unemployed, college mm -hmm. degrees, um, but not quite capable of managing in the workplace. So we're doing a pilot program, individualized employment training, doing real work, um, but learning all of those what we call the soft skills of employment, hmm. how you show up on time, how you talk to a boss, what happens if the schedule changes, now lunch is at 12.30 instead of 12, or you were working on one project, but now we all have to shift gears and work on something else. All of those sorts of things that um, our kids have to experience to learn. Do you find that some uh, employment it makes it more difficult than others for some of these? For some well, of again, each individual is, yeah. is very different, but environment is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, for somebody who is, um, you know, anxious or easily stressed by noise, perhaps an office where the phones are ringing all the time is not necessarily a good environment, where a more quiet office might be a better environment. Um, all of those sorts of things that you really don't know until you try. Does the, uh, does the ASRC help in assessing which environment would be better for certain yes, people? Yes, that's, that's part of the point of the um, employment program is the individual comes in, we have school records, we talk to the individual themselves, we talk to family, um, and kind of assess where they're at, what their needs are, and try to find some sort of work that would be suitable and for them, both their interests, their strengths and abilities, real work.
-hmm. And then they'd be doing that. They would all come together in this, what we call a hub. Mm. So like rather than somebody, let's say, doing data entry on their desk at home, you'd go to an office to this hub where there might be a group of people, some doing data entry, some doing different types of jobs. But you're practicing those social skills in that environment, yet you're still doing real work for a real employer for real wages. Now, is there a continuing uh, on-site services like a job coach or a mentor? That they In this can... program, yes. yes. How does that absolutely. work? Absolutely. There's, um, there's a job coach, social coach. There's also a project manager who does some of the connection between the employee and the employer because no. we are sourcing these jobs from employers all around the country. Um, so there has to be that connection as well, but also helping our folks to learn how to manage that mm. with the ultimate goal that hopefully They'll go on and do it themselves. Right. You know, right, once right. once you've learned how to do something, then you can go out and do it. But if nobody sits down and teaches you, how are you supposed to know how to do it? Right. Employment is such an important part for our people on the spectrum. What what services uh, are you able to apply to the employer themselves to prepare them for the challenges? Uh, we certainly have lots of services. We can do a lot of training in terms of just understanding generally autism spectrum disorders, working with an employer to understand the needs of that particular individual. And I find oftentimes if you can just explain some of the challenges, people are very willing and open to trying something. But if they don't know, right, right. how can they? Right. And in most cases, most employers are willing to help out and make whatever a accommodations. Lot are, a lot are. We're, yeah. we're finding that, because um, our folks are excellent workers, <laughs> um, are. really good at many things. Um, so if you're focusing on getting the job done, absolutely. One of the important parts about working also is transportation. How does that piece play into the Well, that's a help? huge problem here in the state of Connecticut generally, mm. um, not just for folks on the spectrum, but anybody who um, doesn't drive. Mm. Um, it can be really challenging in some of our towns to get anywhere. And I know when I, I, one of the issues I bring up in my transition classes is thinking about driving. And there are assessments you can get to see whether somebody can learn how to drive. Um, and getting over that fear we all have as parents <laughs> about letting our kids out on the cars. Um, or perhaps um, learning about how to use buses and public transportation. There are, we can connect you with resources that can help what they call travel train. I love that term. Right. Um, but how do you, I have a friend whose daughter learned how to use the bus to get from Hamden to downtown New Haven so she can go to Gateway and she can go to the store and she can go to various places. And the independence is amazing. What are, the, what are the challenges in travel training? Because I know that's so important. Help our, our listeners to understand a little bit more about that. Well, again, understanding not only um, you know, which bus routes to take, which is right. a fairly simple task, but also the sort of the social skills of how you ride the bus. Who do you sit next to? Do you talk to them? What do you do if they start right. talking to you and maybe you just want to read your book or listen to your music? Or if it's a loud bus, maybe you will listen to your music because that's more calming for you. Um, what to do if you miss your bus? Or if there's, heaven forbid, it's Connecticut, traffic. Um, and now you're going to be late for where you're going and the anxiety level is rising. How to manage that in a socially appropriate way. Mm. Now, I remember uh, from our conversation earlier that you mentioned another support service is housing. Tell us a little bit about that. We have um, a new project um, working on housing. Housing, like transportation here in Connecticut, is a challenge, um, particularly for those with um, disabilities. Um, there's no place you call and say, hi, my son is 18 and now he needs an apartment of his own. <laughs> that would be really nice. Um, and there isn't a lot of... Uh, state support for that through any of the state agencies. So families really have to think about what can they do, can they band together, uh, find you know roommates, all of that sort of thing, and all of the issues in housing, all of the independent living skills, what kinds of supports might be needed. Some, some people might need somebody to live with them and, and be a support. Others might be able to manage fine on their own with somebody coming in once a week to just check and make sure everything's kind of going okay. Excellent. Are there any other services that, you, that you'd like to mention uh, that are relevant to people on the spectrum that we'd like to talk about? 
Um, I, as I said, I think the the main ones from our office are social and recreational right. programs, um, particularly because that's such a it's a huge part of life. And they're the ones that are most well attended, I'm sure. They're very yeah, well yeah. attended. So we've talked about the services for parents and for those in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that there are other supportive services, like uh, the legislative piece. Let's talk about that for a minute. Sure, absolutely. Um, one of the things we spend a lot of time doing is talking to um, the state agencies, policymakers, legislators about the services and supports that our families need. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to get them if we don't tell people we need them. And so particularly this year, um, in a very difficult budget year, budget cuts left, right, and center, mm -hmm. um, we really have to be very vocal about our needs. Um, and you know, our needs are just as important as many other people's needs, but we have to be vocal about them. Mm -hmm. And we have to say, you know, enough is enough. Uh, maybe there's some other ways we could be saving monies. And I think you mentioned that there is an Autism Awareness Day. Is that? Yes, yes. April is Autism Awareness Month, has mm -hmm. been for many, many years. And what we have done for a number of years now is have a day in April where we gather in Hartford at the Capitol to um, meet and greet with our legislators and policymakers, families, individuals on the spectrum, and our policymakers to talk about what has been done and what is being proposed to be done. Um, this year it's April 8th mm -hmm. um, at the Capitol, okay. uh, run from 10 to 12. We have a press conference. We have um, a few speakers. The legislators will speak as well. And what's fun this year for the first time, we are giving out um, an award. We had a, an autism awareness project. So we had kids ages 12 to 18 submit autism awareness projects and so we're giving out our first award for that and I'm very excited about that because oh, the, the person we've chosen did a fabulous project. Well, what was the very project exciting. about? Um, well the point was again it was for um, a project to be done by youth between the ages of 12 and 18 okay. um, about autism awareness but it was meant to have a true impact not just a nice poster on the wall which is very useful but really something that either went out into the community or deeper within the school um, was inclusive. Um, we wanted it to be both folks on the spectrum and their neurotypical peers working together on a project. Um, so this um, young girl from Middletown High School did a wonderful project um, with a hashtag, everybody has talents. <laughs> and so she had um, everybody, her friends, as well as um, her friends on the spectrum, take pictures of themselves doing good things and posting it on um, Twitter. That was really great. It was just exactly the sort of thing we were looking for. It was a celebration. It was empowering. Um, there were no stereotypes. And it's something that she says she's already seen um, in the lunchroom, you know, one of the kids on the spectrum sitting with a group of cheerleaders, which never would have happened. Mm, and that's exactly what we were looking Great. for. Oh, good to hear it. Now, when you talk with the legislators, are they receptive to the, to the issues? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, you know, they're very receptive to the issues. When it comes down to money, that's always where the rubber hits the road on any um, piece of legislation. But usually if you explain what the problem is and can bring them a solution, hmm. um, they are very open. So as parents want to be effective in that, how should they approach the legis legislator? What should they say? What kind of issues should they address? Well, the first thing you should do is meet your local legislator, whether mm -hmm. it's your state senator or your state representative. Um, they work for you. Um, so you can go up to their office or in the off sessions, you can call them up at home um, in your town. Their numbers are, are out there. And talk to them. Let them know what the challenges are that you're facing and how you would like government to help you, how they could help you, what laws could be changed, strengthened, what different types of resources could be put out there that would help you. Excellent, excellent. What about And have to meet your kids. <laughs> That's always important, isn't it? Absolutely. Tell us about some of the work that ARSRC has done in the legislative area in the past. Any successful um, advo advocacy that well, they've done? Well, we've been done? advocating for, for many years for many things. Um, it's a bit of a long slog getting mm -hmm. anything done. But I would say that the biggest uh, impact we have had is at our DDS, our Department of Disability Services, we now have an autism division. Um, we did not, and for many years, for folks with an autism spectrum disorder who did not also have an intellectual disability, who had an intact IQ, there was no place for them. 
And now we have this division within DDS that services those folks. It's small. Uh, right. It has not, you know, the wide variety of services m one might like in a perfect world, but the division is there. There are some services. There's already a five-year wait list, so that tells you even for what we have, there's still a wait list. Um, we need more, but it's, it's a wonderful start, and that's, that's how these things work. Good. Now, in addition to uh, the advocacy, I also understand that ASRC is effective with insurance. Can you tell us a little bit about how insurance can be effective in, in helping Well, what we've done you? is... Um, help families navigate um, right. the insurance process because the insurance process can be very tricky. Um, as a former um, insurance attorney, I could go on for days about the differences, but you know, different policies, different ways of coverage, but helping families to understand what insurance they do have um, and what it might cover, um, what insurance options they might have now under the Affordable Care Act and what that might cover in terms of autism. Uh, one of the things we've been working on very hard and are really thrilled about is um, getting Medicaid coverage for our Husky folks mm. um, for uh, services for folks on the spectrum because until recently that was not available. Um, but the federal agencies in charge of that came out this summer saying that you did have to cover it for children under the age of 18. And so Connecticut is one of the first three states to actually implement that. Oh, excellent. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. That's so, great work. Working very hard. And there's a ton of bumps in the road, but it's a good start. Now for something fun. I understand that every year you do an annual walk. Yes, Tell yes, us about we do. that. Yes, we do. It's our major fundraiser, provides a good chunk of our operating budget for the year. Um, it's a wonderful day. It will be sat uh, Sunday, sorry, May 3rd, um, in Wallingford, where our offices are located. Uh, we start at Choate, a wonderful supporter of ours. They've been a supporter for many years. And the walk itself actually walks through downtown Wallingford, which, okay. if you've ever had a chance to walk or drive through, is beautiful, beautiful and historic. Oh, oh, um, nice. Lots of little shops mm -hmm. and, and lovely houses to walk through. And as you walk along the walk route, there are activities along the walk route to do, to stop and be entertained. And then you come back to the field where there's a whole bunch of activities. Um, we have a jello contest. We have a Lego contest. Um, we have vendors. We have moon bounces. We have music playing a Zumba. Um, we have food trucks this year. Very excited. Everybody's very excited about the food trucks. <laughs> um, we have a touch a truck for the little kids. And so not just a fire truck, but other trucks that they can touch and climb on. Little kids seem to love that. Um, we have, uh, you know, a contest for best team shirt, best dressed dog. Best dressed dog. Best dressed dog. We love dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Any dog welcome. <laughs> Any dog welcome. Exactly. So it's a fun family event as well as a walk and our, our major fundraiser. So how does it work as a fundraiser? I'm assuming anybody can come. Oh, but, yes. So how does it work for raising funds? What happens is um, people um, create teams or they do it individually and they get pledges from from friends and family. These days, everybody does it online. Um, we have a, a walk website, uh, and you can create your own walk page and send it out to your friends on Twitter and Facebook and email and all of those ways and collect donations. People can just click and use their credit card, and it goes right through, so it's very simple. Um, we have people who raise thousands of dollars for us. Wow, yeah, great. It's wonderful. And typical turnout, how many people are usually coming to these? I believe last year we had about 3,000 people. Wow, that's excellent. Yeah, it's it's really great. Now you said it's May 3rd. Right? Sunday, May 3rd. What happens if it's raining? Is there a rain date? Rain or shine. Rain or shine. Yeah. So come dressed. <laughs> exactly. And this year you might need your mud boots. <laughs> <laughs> now you also mentioned earlier that there's an annual conference. Uh, I, I believe that actually just happened. Tell us about that. Last weekend um, okay. was our 25th annual conference. Wow, so congratulations. So we're doing the conference a long time. The silver time. anniversary. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Makes me feel old. Um, <laughs> it, uh, currently, in its current format, it is a two-day event. Uh, we are co-sponsored with the uh, Center of Excellence on Autism Spectrum Disorders at Southern. So the okay. conference itself is held at Southern, which is a wonderful facility. Um, we bring in um, national and international keynote speakers. Our Friday keynote speaker was uh, Dr. Peter Vermeulen, who came from Belgium. Mm. Uh, and he was a great hit. Every, he, people raved um, about his presentation. We also do workshops where, again, we feature uh, professionals from here in Connecticut talking about all sorts of topics related to raising children with autism or teaching children with autism or adults. 
um, so you can go to those workshops. And then Saturday we have an extended keynote and we um, have something we have had for 25 years, which is our speaker from the spectrum. Mm. We have always had an adult or young adult um, with an autism spectrum disorder at our conference talking about what it's like to be a person with an autism spectrum disorder. Mm. And I have always found that is the most entertaining and informative piece of the conference is to, is to listen and I think it's so important for families, educators, and individuals themselves to see somebody successful, right. capable, who can get up in front of 500 people. Not everybody can get up in front of 500 people and give a presentation, right. Um, right. neurotypical or not. Mm. Right. <laughs> um, so it's a really, really great opportunity. In fact, public speaking is very difficult. One of the, I think people yes. fear it more than death. <laughs> they do. <laughs> some of the statistics. They do. And we had probably in the neighborhood of about 500 people or so. Wow, excellent. Um, over the two days. Great. So it's a great event. Okay. Now, how can people learn more about ASRC and, and all the work? What, what, some well, the resources? easiest way is to go to our website. Website, right. Which is um, Autism Connecticut. That's Connecticut spelled out, um, dot org. And you can find out everything you needed to know about us. You can send us an email from there. You can link to our Facebook page and follow us on Facebook right. and see what we're doing. Or you can call us. Um, What's the phone number? 203-265-7717. Uh, okay. uh, we're there Monday through Thursday. And we have a real person who answers the phone, which people are usually very surprised at. <laughs> Not one of those press ones. Right. <laughs> um, so somebody will answer the phone and hopefully be able to give you the information you seek or connect you with somebody who can. Great. Well, in just a, a couple minutes left, uh, any concluding thoughts, uh, Sarah, that you'd like to share with us? Um, well, thank you very much for having me, definitely. And I just, You're welcome. when I was looking back, I realized I had been on this show five years ago. Wow. I was the first guest. Well, thanks for coming again. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so exciting to me that five years down the road, it's still here, it's vibrant. Um, more and more um, individuals are coming and doing and learning and having right. fun. And it's just right. so exciting to see something that you started just continue and right. sustain. Well, congratulations and thank you for your support all these years as well. And You're thanks welcome. for coming again tonight to share. No problem, with us. anytime. Really appreciate it. Well, we hope you enjoyed our show today and learning from Sarah about ASRC and all the benefits and services that they offer, the great work that they're doing and also how to access them. And many thanks to our friends at ASRC for their continued support. We hope you join us again next time. I'm Larry Walters, and from all of us here at On the Spectrum, thanks for watching, and goodbye. Turn, 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 not to spread all